pleasure. In fact, I don't even think I need the, uh, the, the, uh, the microphone, but it's on. Uh, what a pleasure. Uh, on behalf of Lieutenant General Rocco and the Marines Memorial Association, thank you for uh, joining us tonight for our third 2023 lecture series. Uh, and it's my pleasure to uh, introduce a good friend and uh, the commanding general of the 1st Marine Division. So Sounds good. Good. <laughs> All right. Thanks. Oh, yeah. Do we, we need to... five minutes, then it's all you. Ten, all right. Is that how much is left or how far? All right. Do I need to do what? Hey, I'm going to... Holy cow. That's loud. Can we adjust that a little bit? Thanks. I, I made a couple notes just so I don't uh, uh, go overboard here tonight, but uh, it's really an honor to be here, and uh, thanks, thanks for... For allowing me to come in up to our, you know, our, I like to think of this as our club and uh, and talk a little bit about what the First Marine Division is doing. I feel kind of like uh, I, I mean, we're in the wrong order here. My boss, uh, who's uh, you know the important guy, was here last month, and so I should have been probably the warm up act for for him, not following in trace. But uh, but I appreciate it. And Chris, thanks uh, for the, keeping the introduction short. Uh, Chris and I go, go way back, and uh, the only bad thing about having him here is nothing ruins a good story like an eyewitness, so I can't, uh, I can't tell a lot of uh, what I was going to. But uh, Sheila is, uh, known Chris and Sheila for, for a long time, and in fact, last time uh, that, that we, you know, Chris and Sheila were down in Southern California, uh, you know, what I love about Sheila is she, she tells it straight, and uh, we went out to dinner with them uh, in, at, at Oceanside, uh, and, you know, so we were, you know, kind of having some appetizers and a couple of drinks and uh, I was catching up and, and all of a sudden Sheila just got up and just bolted towards the back of the restaurant and threw her arms around this guy who was bussing tables back there. It was a little weird because she didn't, you know, excuse her, she just kind of got up and took off and Chris was kind of uncomfortable, but we were sort of, you know, one of those nervous laughs and kind of like, <laughs> you know, I wonder what's going on. And so we're just... Uh, you know, we keep talking and everything, but you can tell it's, 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 you know, he keeps looking over there and, you know, she's holding onto his arms and they're laughing and, and this goes on for about 10 minutes or so. And so you can tell Chris is really getting a little uncomfortable uh, because he, you know, he, and I'm like, hey, who is that dude? And he says, I don't know. Um, and so finally, you know, you know, he's throwing, he starts, you know, he's almost throwing dirty looks that way. Finally, she comes back and, and Chris like, huh, you know, who is that? And, and she was says, well, it was Joey. Uh, my high school boyfriend. You know, I dated him through most of high school, and I haven't seen him in, in forever. And, and, and Chris is like, <laughs> well, yeah, busting tables, huh? He's like, I, I bet you're glad you married a uh, Marine colonel then, huh? And uh, she, she doesn't miss a beat. She just looks at him and goes, honey, if I'd have married Joey, he would have been the Marine colonel. <laughs> so... Chris and I go back a ways. Um, I, will, uh, I will tell you, it, it's a fascinating, I think, a fascinating time to be uh, a Marine. Uh, you know, it's, when I first came in the Marine Corps, uh, probably long before all you young folks served, um, you know, there was shortly uh, after General Gray released uh, FMFM1 at the time, war fighting kind of our seminal doctrinal pub. And there was this like intellectual buzz about the Marine Corps. I mean, it was just a fascinating time uh, to come in because everybody's wrestling with all these new ideas and concepts like commander's intent and main effort and centers of gravity and critical vulnerability and the nature and character of war. And it was just, uh, it was neat. It was stimulating. I mean, guys were almost, you know, getting fistfights about attritionists versus maneuverists. And um, I haven't felt that way about or in the core or about the core, really, sit un, un, again, until the last uh, few years. And so, you know, there, I, I realize there are lots of uh, opinions about, uh, I think, some info well informed, some not, uh, about, you know, where the Marine Corps is headed, what we're doing, uh, why there are some changes in the Marine Corps, but it's a fascinating conversation to be a part of. Um, you know, in my last job, I spent so the first three years of General Berger's commandancy at the Marine Corps Warfighting Lab. Uh, so by, by sort of billet, uh, I had a you know, front row seat and a part in this whole Force Design 2030 process. 
And so a lot of folks think it's just justice that now I'm on the receiving end uh, as the CG of the 1st Marine Division, uh, having kind of been part of the, the good idea folks and the, the new concepts and things, and now having to wrestle with the implementation and balancing how do you build that future force uh, with being ready to fight tonight. You know, so if, if the call comes, uh, how do, are, are we ready to fight the division? Uh, are our Marines ready? So, you know, and, and some are really just sort of a fascinating time, I think, uh, to be a Marine. I, I will tell you up front that, you know, I, I, so I'm, I, I'm used to talking about that kind of stuff, and I'll take any questions anybody has over the course of this thing. You know, kind of this way is north, hold all questions to the end, doesn't apply. If, if, if anybody's interested uh, or I say something that, piques your interest or, or you want to talk, just, just, you know, shout and I'm happy to take a question. What I, what I thought might be interesting in the meantime is just to talk a little bit about what the division's up to um, these days, what we're focused on, and again, take any, any questions that you all have if that works. Um, so there's, there's really no doubt that what we're you know, what we're seeing as we look globally in places like, uh, you know, Armenia and Azerbaijan, uh, in Yemen, in Ukraine, uh, and we look at sort of the activities uh, of China in, in the Western Pacific, I mean, there, there's no doubt that, that there are some things that are, are different. You know, the nature of war remains the same, fog and friction and uncertainty and fear, and all those things are, are part of it. But you know, the human element, all, all those things are enduring. But the character of war and kind of, you know, what we're preparing for, you know, it is evolving uh, in ways that are important for us to be ready for. Uh, and so <clears throat> while we don't want to knee-jerk, uh, you know, we, we don't want to uh, take the wrong lessons by sort of looking superficially at, at some of the things we think we're seeing, uh, there are certainly some adaptation that has to take place. And when you're on a fixed budget, you know, that's tough, right? Because you, you can't just keep all the stuff that you have and keep doing things the same way and get the new stuff that you need, uh, you know. So that's sort of the art of it, and that's really what the Commandant has wrestled with uh, over the last few years. And so, and, and what it boils down to is just risk, you know. Uh, you see it happening in the other services, too. If you watch the news and you... You see the tension over the Air Force divesting of A-10s, for instance, you know, which is a phenomenal close air support aircraft that, you know, that I've relied on many times uh, to, you know, to, to, to come in and do what that aircraft was designed to do uh, in combat. And, and so you know, tugs on the heartstrings, uh, but, but the Air Force can't keep all of those legacy platforms that are highly vulnerable uh, you know, to, to threats that are now proliferating widely they can't keep all of those and still have, because the, the maintenance costs are just enormous to keep those things flying and invest in the new platforms they need to, need to meet the challenge of a rising China, uh, et cetera. So, you know, those, those are, are some of the tensions. In, in the Marine Corps, you know, it, it's particularly interesting, I think, because, you know, our history, right, and our traditions that are born of that history, that they, they empower us. Uh, it is so much a part of who we are and what we believe and why we fight and how we, we, we demand that Marines win on every battlefield and every climb and place is that sense of standing on the shoulders of giants, uh, that sense of, of history and the importance of our traditions. And it's empowering, uh, but can also be an anchor, quite frankly, to progress. Uh, and you see that tension uh, today in terms of, you know, and, and we really have to, I think, rise above that a little bit. and. Um, and recognize that it can be an impediment to innovation uh, and, and to recognizing some of the changes in the character of war and that what, what worked and we honor because it worked, uh, you know, on, on a previous battlefield, you know, may, may not be uh, what's going to work on a future battlefield. And, and finding the sweet spot sort of between those things that are enduring uh, and those things that need to evolve is, is really challenging. And, and, and I, you know, I, I started out talking about, you know, hey, just, you know, the commandant wrestling with these things. We're wrestling with these things. Sergeants are wrestling with these things uh, as they look at, you know, the, the nature of the threats that we face. Um, so, you know, China has been the, obviously, front and center. But, you know, um, you know, 
I, I guess the best way to describe it is, you know, you may have heard the term pacing threat. You know, I, I don't know that China is the, uh, you know, that, that that's the most likely future adversary, but, but it's the one, you know, we never seem to get that right, uh, where and when we're going to fight next. Uh, but it is the adversary we've been given as a pacing adversary. Uh, so in other words, because they're evolving the quickest uh, and putting, you know, having really the most success uh, in, in building a, a military that, you know, that may someday rival that of the United States, we've been kind of given them as the yardstick to sort of measure uh, our investments by and our priorities by. And so we have to take that into account while still being ready to handle threats really you know, across the range of military operations. So, uh, you know, China's, it's a factor, um, but not the only one. You know, so we're, we're exploring, you know, some of these new concepts, and the concept's what? It's a hypothesis, you know. Expeditionary advanced base operations, distributed maritime operations, stand-in forces, these are, really kind of hypotheses about what might work you know, in, a, in a maritime littoral environment against a, a peer level adversary like China, right? Um, and, and then we're, we're investing in experimentation um, with new technologies and things like that. And then we're also sort of wrestling with the impact of some of the, the divestment decisions the Marine Corps has made, right? Uh, getting rid of tanks, some of our mobility assets like bridging capabilities, military police, um, you know, some of those sorts of things rebalancing our indirect fires portfolio, so less cannon artillery, more HIMARS rocket artillery, uh, and some anti-ship capability. Um, you know, n none of that's an indictment of cannon artillery. It's just a recognition that we don't have enough money to keep all the cannon artillery, buy more HIMARS, and buy anti-ship missiles. We've got to rebalance a little bit. Uh, you know, but, you know, what does that mean? You know, wh what can we still do? What can we not do that we used to be able to? I mean, those are those are the things that, that, we're, that we're wrestling with. Um, I would just say, you know, rest assured uh, that as far as the 1st Marine Division goes, though, uh, you know, we've still, we, we still pack a hell of a punch uh, in the same way that you would expect and, you know, you, you have come to expect uh, your Marine Corps to do. Uh, we've got about 22,000 uh, Marines and sailors. We've still got three infantry regiments of, of four battalions each. We've still got an artillery regiment of three cannon battalions and a high Mars battalion. You know, we've got uh, two light armor reconnaissance battalions, a reconnaissance battalion, um, assault uh, amphibious vehicles, transitioning to the amphibious combat vehicle. We still have a mix of, of both of those. Uh, and we have a, uh, still our combat engineer battalion. Look a lot like what, what you, would have seen at any point over the last few decades. Uh, but we're, we're experimenting again with some new capabilities, we're fielding some new capabilities, and we, and we have divested of a few other capabilities. But I think you'd be impressed. And I'll tell you, we have never had, I don't think the world has ever seen more lethal infantry than we have now. Uh, if, if you saw the investments that had been made, and a lot of this I think can be attributed to General Mattis, um, with his close key, when he was the Secretary of Defense, he instituted a close combat lethality task force, and that has resulted in some really impressive uh, investments in our ground combat forces. And so I think, you know, unquestionably, we have the most lethal infantry that the world has ever seen. I believe that, uh, not just a bumper sticker. Uh, and, you know, I'm happy to unpack any bit of that. So we're kind of... Um, we're kind of in a position, though, where as, as we look at, at the threats, um, in particular, as you look at the way the fight's going in the Ukraine, and, and you consider some of the differences in terms of balance that we've got with indirect fires and things, I think the real question we're wrestling with is, is the, this whole like, combined arms thing. Um, combined arms, which has been you know, central to the Marine Corps' ethos and, and, and approach to warfighting. Um, you know, shoot, for at least since World War II, right? Um, at least, you know, acknowledged and, and intuitively before that. But what is combined arms in the 21st century? I mean, if, you're, if your definition of co combined arms is simply, you know, infantry, tanks, and artillery, then I think, you, you, you know, you, you got it wrong. Combined arms is about using different tools to create a dilemma for the enemy. Uh, 
such that when he tries to react to one, he's vulnerable to another. And the tools are not defined by any one particular piece of equipment. So getting rid of tanks doesn't mean that we can no longer do combined arms. It just means that's one tool that's been you know, replaced by others, or we have to think differently. But now we have to think about things that we, you know, certainly Marines are not used to thinking about, cyber, uh, space, the electromagnetic spectrum, uh, because those things are not just like Star Trek things that, I mean, th those things are resident at the small unit level, uh, not just in peer adversary forces like China and Russia, but amongst dime store adversaries around the world, because you can just, like swipe right on Amazon and, and buy a drone that is really easy to put, you know, an electronic warfare or payload on or modify to carry some kind of, you know, munition that you can drop or, uh, I mean, there's all kinds of different, I mean, the creativity is, is incredible. Uh, so, so we've got to think about that stuff. Um, most of our time, we have three, and I'll kind of just uh, frame the, the, things, the, the three things the division's focused on, really. One is uh, division as a force provider. That's kind of the must-pay bill. And that means you know, uh, uh, the division deploying units forward on our Marine Expeditionary Units uh, to Okinawa, Japan, as part of the unit deployment program, and to Australia, which has been something new over the last 10 years, but is, you know, has continued to increase in size and value. Uh, I, I will just use this, so we got, you, you may be familiar with this whole Title 42 thing. Um, Title 42, it, this has come and gone over the last few years, but it's this, I don't know if it's a law or a policy, but I think it's a policy, but um, basically allows for quick deportation of illegal immigrants when they come across the border, uh, largely focused on the southern border. And, and it's a deterrent, right? Because n immigrants, n you know, folks know that if they sneak across and get caught, they can just be shipped back and made to wait south of the border while their case is being heard for asylum or whatever. That's about to expire, uh, which they think will now uh, result in a flood of uh, attempts at illegal immigration. So they've you know, kind of gone to the bullpen, called in some active duty folks to augment uh, Department of Homeland Security and NORTHCOM, um, you know, long wind up to a short pitch, which is that part of that bill is to 1st Marine Division for a couple of hundred Marines, basically two companies of 100 Marines each as part of this force. Uh, I, you know, I thought, hey, like when I first heard it, yeah, you know, 22,000 Marines, yeah, no problem. We got it, we'll find you a, a couple of companies. But w when we deploy for any of the missions I talked about, it's not just an infantry battalion. That's our kind of base unit. Yeah, but w they got an artillery battery. They got an, a light armored reconnaissance company. They got a reconnaissance platoon. They got a combat engineer platoon. Um, and, and they've got usually some AM trackers, uh, you know, that, that go with them. So it's kind of a... Uh, you know, whether it's a battalion landing team on a MU, or it's, it's the same kind of force. It's a, it's a task-organized formation like, like Marines are familiar with. Uh, so we got 12 of those in 1st Marine Division. You know, 12 infantry battalions as a base, and, and that's kind of what we rotate in and out of the fight. Well, you know, two 100-man companies, I start thinking about it, and, and all of a sudden, you, you, count, the, you count what you're doing. Uh, of those 12, four... Uh, of those battalion teams are currently deployed. Um, four are uh, less than 180 days out from deployment, uh, which means they're in the crucial part of their pre-deployment training, and I cannot task them with, you know, send in a couple hundred folks to, to a border mission. That's eight of 12. Uh, two of those battalions just got back within the last 30 days. So they've been deployed for six or seven months and just got home. So I can't send them. So now uh, 10 of 12 battalions uh, and, and their associated reinforcements uh, off the table. Uh, one of, of those battalions is our Infantry Battalion Experimentation Unit, 3rd Battalion, 4th Marines out of 29 Pumps. So they are a service priority, uh, continuing to refine some of the changes that, uh, that the Commandant is looking at for the future Infantry Battalion. So really important when you consider that's kind of the foundational unit uh, you know, for us as, as a Marine Corps. So that, that leaves me with one battalion, and that battalion's got companies deploying to three different overseas locations over the next three months, 
um, for, for other things that we've been tasked with. So all of a sudden, it's like, I can't find 200 guys uh, and gals that, that can, can go do this. So we, of, of course we did, you know, we uh, turned the ratchet and, and, and able to put together, and we're not just gonna pull two guys from here and three from over there. I mean, we're gonna send cohesive units. So, you know, we've managed to, to pull that together, but it's really hard. So just to give you a sense of, of how busy uh, our folks are right now, I mean, we're, we're stretched uh, pretty thin, as busy as, as you know, Marines have ever been. Right now, we're at about, for every, you know, for every month deployed, Marines are home for just over two months. So six-month deployment, home for just over a year, back out for six months. And, and that, that is sustainable, but it, it's, it's getting close to the point where, you know, uh, you, you know it's challenging to turn those battalions around, uh, go through all the personnel turnover after a deployment, put it, bring in the rest of the team and train them again for the new deployment. So we're kind of, we're good, but we're, you know, we don't have any excess capacity. Um, we do have some munitions challenges, you know, I mean, the, the munitions that we've been sending over to Ukraine, uh, uh, 155 millimeter high explosive, so our cannon artillery rounds, HIMARS, uh, GIMORS rounds, um, and, and um, you know, there, there are a couple others that, you know, are a little bit uh, challenging for us right now. That impacts on training, but so we've got less, but right now we've, we've got enough, uh, but it, it's less. There's, I would say if there's, you know, so short, some short-term pain, though, um, uh, not quite able to train, you know, it, it, you know, with as much ammunition as we've become accustomed to, but enough to do what we have to do. The two good things I would suggest, though, is that one, it's kind of energized our industrial base. So as our capacity has shrunk uh, to produce munitions uh, as a nation, uh, now this is, we've got a, a pretty big demand signal. Uh, and so it will take a, a year or two for this to ramp up. But when it does, you know, it, we're going to be cooking, and that will be a good thing. Uh, the other thing I'd suggest, you know, people have different opinions about whether we ought to be sending ammunition and things to equipment and, and money to Ukraine. Uh, if we consider, you know, our primary threats, China and Russia, well, this is a pretty cost-effective way, uh, you know, to, uh, you know, to counter the Russian military. You know, I mean, we're not losing any humans on, on the U.S. side, uh, just providing a lot of ammunition, and, and it's obviously taking a pretty big chunk out of, uh, out of the Russian capability. Um, so the second thing is division, you know, so divi force provider is the first big bin. Second big bin of three is division as a warfighter. Um, and, and so we are expected to be able to fight the division. So if, if we've got to go back into, you know, you name the place, uh, and, and, and it, this is not a battalion fight, and this is not just hopping around small islands or something, but, but we've got to, you know, we've got to go in and take on a, a peer level adversary, then we've got to be able to fight the 1st Marine Division. Uh, and so we're focused on that. Uh, I would say we've got a lot more diverse opportunities, uh, but the tempo has been pretty high. So in the last year, you know, we spent, uh, the division spent uh, about uh, three weeks out at 29 Palms in the desert doing conventional combined arms war fighting in a uh, non-live fire force on force exercise, division level, uh, which was fantastic. I mean, um, and then uh, we, we spent almost a month in the field in November and December, and that was more focused on naval war fighting. So uh, integration with the Navy and thinking through if, if on a future battlefield, it's not, we, we don't just own space on land here but we own water space too. Uh, and, and we've got to be able to integrate fires that come from Navy ships uh, as well as ashore. Uh, how, how do you do that uh, against targets on land and against targets on the water? Because you know, we don't have the luxury of, uh, the, and, anymore of just drawing a line at the high water mark and saying, okay, Navy, you got everything you know, uh, that gets wet and we'll take everything on this side. That's just not the way. The range of, of munitions and things these days, I mean, it, you just can't draw a line there, uh, or, or you're vulnerable. So we focused on that. We went to Korea for a month in March, uh, deployed the division headquarters, uh, and acted as the commander of the landing force uh, for a combined um, exercise with the 1st uh, Rock Marine Division. So I was the commander of the landing force. Uh, we had a Navy commander of the amphibious task force, uh, and, the, and this exercise scenario was an amphibious assault 
uh, into North Korea. And, and, you know, so that's, you know, combined with the Koreans, uh, supported by the Navy, the Air Force, and the Army. Uh, and then uh, in an environment, it was January in North Korea, uh, was the you know, scenario, which is pretty chilly. So we had to get back into, you know, kind of cold weather war fighting. And then uh, chemical, biological, radiological environment, uh, mines in the water and ashore. So how do you work your way through that? So it forced us to confront uh, oh, really the toughest challenges that, that we might have to. It, it was good. So we spent about a month in Korea doing that. And we're headed to Australia in July for about a month um, to, do, to work with the uh, 1st Australian Division and uh, a Navy, Navy Marine Task Force out of uh, 7th Fleet in Japan, composed of the Expeditionary Strike Group there and uh, the 31st Marine Expeditionary Unit. So we're going to be working with them, combination of MAGTAF operations ashore and uh, Expeditionary Advanced Base Operations, you know, support to uh, sea denial. So, you know, we've got some range uh, these days, but I would just tell you we're getting a workout, and, and every bit of it is forcing us to wrestle with how do we command and control the division uh, and make sure the division is ready to fight. Uh, the last thing is uh, of the three bins is I would just sort of, we call it division uh, against the pacing threat, and it's really kind of the, uh, the experimentation and the innovation side of things. You know, how do we, you know, this future infantry battalion that we're, that we're evolving towards, how do we make sure we've got that right as we continue to kind of refine it here over time? Um, if we're going to own battle space that's not just on land but also on the water, well, it's not good enough to just stand on the water's edge with a set of binoculars, you know, looking out over the water and say, you know, you know and, and that we've got game uh, and that we can control and, and affect our battle space. We've got to get back in to boats. Uh, on the surface of the water, things that can swim. Uh, we've got to have, whether it flies over the water or operates on the water, we've got to have the ability to sense and shoot in a bigger, more diverse, multi-domain battle space. So we're working on that kind of stuff. Um, and, and a whole bunch of different, you know, things that are related. Signature management, you know, all the satellites these days, all the different electronic warfare capabilities, the range of adversary air, airborne systems, manned and unmanned. How do we hide? Uh, so that we can survive and then effectively fight and apply what we do against, you know, the same enemy. So it's, it, it's kind of a fascinating time. Um, last thing I'll, I'll just mention is just people. Um, probably should have started with that, you know, because, uh, you know, the Marine Corps, I mean, it's still foundational, right? Uh, we equip the Marine, we don't man the equipment. I, I still believe that that is uh, absolutely the way we approach things. Um, there's been a lot of press on some of the equipment just because it's new, uh, but that doesn't mean that that's our focus is just the equipment. A you know, couple things that we're wrestling with, I would just say uh, COVID's uh, had an impact um, in ways that I didn't really recognize uh, until I had taken a, you know, kind of a trip around the block as a division commander. Uh, Marine, you know, our units are still tough, uh, and, and, you know, and when they go out the door, they're ready to fight. Um, but there are individuals, <coughs> excuse me, who uh, I, I would just say don't have the same level of coping skills that most of us did, you know, at that age. Um, and I th and I, I've come to believe it. And my wife Emily, who you know, we have a we have the six million dollar cat at home now. Um, we, we've got dogs and cats, but this morning one of the cats kind of took a dive, had to go to the vet ER, and so she had to drop off the trip. Um, unfortunately, and it sound, I feel ridiculous up here as a two-star Marine saying that, but, um, but that's actually what happened. Um, and, and she's the one who had originally, she, as a nurse, kind of dialed me into this. But, you know, when you think about where, where you build your coping skills, uh, where you develop a little bit of a thick skin, you work your way through kind of social interaction and things like that. I mean, like the seminal time in, in a young man or woman's life is really high school, is, is where... And the, the Marines that we have today in that, you know, 75% of them or whatever, in that sort of 18 to 22-year-old category, where were they during COVID? High school. So when, when most folks, most of us were kind of, you know, uh, you know, dealing with bullies or getting in fights and boyfriends and girlfriends and, and, and building all those kind of coping skills that, that, that generate resiliency over time, um, a lot of these folks were sitting at home learning on a computer uh, only 
interacting with friends on their phone. Uh, I, I think it matters. And I think so what you see is uh, folks, in some cases, who have a little bit more propensity to go from zero to 150 when faced with adversity and, and not go through some normal steps that somebody might take to try to wrestle with a problem, ask for help, uh, resolve a conflict, things like that. So, um, I mean, it, it, it's a consideration. Um, you know, we're not in crisis or anything like that, but, but uh, you know, it's been noticeable. Uh, and then retention, you know, or recruiting, really. Retention, we've been pretty successful. We just made our mission for 0311s, infantry, riflemen, retention. In, in other words, keeping Marines in the Marine Corps for the first time in years. Uh, but, but, but some of that is necessary because of the challenges with recruiting. Marine Corps is the only force that made mission uh, or is on track to make mission this year for recruiting. Uh, but it's tight, and it's eating into the pool of folks that normally is kind of the reserve that you go into the next year already in the bank. We're, we're kind of having to draw heavily on them to make a mission. So it's a tough, tough time. I'll stop there. I hope that was, you know, useful, and, uh, but I'm, I'm, I am uh, open book. I'll tell you what I think if uh, anybody's got any questions. So just a reminder, uh, use, please <coughs> use the QR code on your uh, program. Uh, so we don't have folks jumping up. If you have a question, uh, write it down, please, so we can uh, take a look at it and uh, pass it on. But I'm going to go ahead and uh, kick off uh, with the first question, and of course is, who is still the king of battle? Oh, come on, Booch. <laughs> okay. Are you going to make me say that publicly? Yes. Yes, yes, sir, I am. Okay. Uh, You're still the king of battle. The first question is, how has the, how is, how is the mission of the fire team changed or is changing? Uh, it, it has not at all. Uh, I mean, you know, at some point, every, fight, every attack is a frontal attack, right? Um, every, every play is, is just up the middle, smash mouth football. Uh, and the fire team is squarely in that space and, and probably go up several levels from there where th their mission remains to locate, close with, and destroy the enemy with fire and maneuver or repel his assaults by fire in close combat. That has been the mission of the Marine Rifle Squad uh, and platoon for certainly as long as I've been in and, and likely a hell of a lot longer than that. So uh, that has not changed one damn bit. And, and those folks, as I said earlier, are the most lethal Marines that certainly I've ever seen and I would imagine have ever walked the face of the earth. It, they're, they're pretty impressive. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's a good question, sir. I mean, the, the I, would, I would broadly characterize it as, you know, with, with the idea that we can't just keep all the old stuff and buy all the new stuff. I think when it comes to aircraft in particular, uh, what the Commandant recognized is that uh, we, were not, we were not moving much at all, uh, certainly not as fast as we needed to into the unmanned space, uh, and that uh, there was no way that we were going to be able to accelerate our efforts to procure unmanned aircraft and to train the people uh, to, to use them effectively if, if we didn't slim down a little bit on, our, on the manned aircraft and create some, some space within the force to, to do that. So, um, so he made the decision to slim down uh, in some aircraft types uh, a little bit, uh, cut a, couple, you know, a handful of, of squadrons, in order to make space, but then at the same time, he said, we're going to double the number of unmanned aircraft squadrons uh, over the next few years. So that's, that's really, I would say, broadly what we're trying to do is similar to, you know, the indirect fires with artillery is create a balanced portfolio of manned and unmanned systems. You know, there's, you save, <coughs> I mean, we, we all, like, shoot, I mean, like, we're, we're, we have, you know, Three divisions and wings of combined arms by law, 
So, I mean, we are required to, to maintain, uh, you know, a, a significant amount of aviation capacity. But when you look at a platform, a huge uh, part of the size and weight and cost of the platform is the fact you put a human in it. It exponentially reduces uh, all of those factors uh, when you take the human out and make it, it's, nothing's really unmanned. I mean, there's somebody that's flying it. They're just, they're just removed from the, the platform itself. So that, that, that's at least the, the thought process behind it. Um, all the services have slimmed down a little bit. Um, you know, so, you know, there were, there were, it wasn't just aviation. There was, you know, we, we cut three infantry battalions, one regimental headquarters, a handful of squadrons um, to make room to modernize. The Commandant, you know, like a lot of the services, you know, we don't have, uh, at, you know, a whole lot of really big, you know, ACAT-1 expensive programs where we can find money by cutting those program, cutting into those programs. I mean, we've got, you know, people in aviation are probably the levers, the, the primary levers that the Commandant has when he needs to generate some resources to invest somewhere else. So, I don't know if that... Sir. Oh, sir, please follow up if I didn't hit the pitch. I don't know. I don't know how to use no, the QR noted. Code, so. Noted. Thank you, sir, for the question. <laughs> sir, how has the war in the Ukraine influenced or changed your perspective on how the Marine Corps will be employed in accordance with the force design? So I, I think that you know one thing about Ukraine is it, I think it's you know it's an, it's, it's interesting uh, right now. The thing I think we got to be cautious of is uh, people pick and choose uh, what